Howdy neighbors, welcome to Cedar Creek Homestead for another episode of Porch Talk, aired every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. And I appreciate you joining me today, hope you're having a wonderful and blessed day. And today's subject is going to be preparing for a colder than normal winter. And before I get into that subject, I want to talk to you just for a second. If you're not a subscriber, we tend to get a whole lot more viewers than we have subscribers. And I have emails and uh, comments from time to time. Folks want to know how they could help us. The best way to help us is simply subscribing to our channel. If you'd like to do that, hit that subscribe button. While you're there, the little bell will pop up. And when if you click on that little bell, then it'll notify you. That's notifications bell. And up in the top right hand corner, you'll have a notifications area and you can check in your favorite channels, favorite programs will come up there when they air and you'll be notified. But if you'll just tune in here around seven o'clock p.m. Uh, Central Time each Tuesday night while we'll have an episode of Porch Talk and throughout the week we have all different types of other videos. I know they may not apply to everybody, but we are uh, but sure there's something here you would like and I hope you enjoy uh, or will um, enjoy today's video. I hope it'll help you somehow or another um, one way or the other. But anyway, getting into today's subject, one thing we're doing here at Cedar Creek Homestead is we're getting prepared for a colder than normal winter. And uh, to say normal, uh, <laughs> We have not had very cold winters the past few years. I have to say, I'm kind of liking this global warming, <laughs> if there is such a thing. Uh, well, what I mean by that, it has been getting warmer here for several years. Last winter, however, it was a little cooler than what we had been getting used to. This year, it is starting to be cooler a little earlier. And I realize there are all kinds of... Uh, People out there making uh, scientific uh, analysis, uh, you know, some say we're into a global warming, which is man-made global warming because of greenhouse gases such as Freon and different things that's being let off in the atmosphere, pollution from coal-powered uh, fossil fuel plants and all that kind of stuff. And uh, honestly, uh, I just, uh, I, uh, well, now they say because we have, have had colder and earlier winters, they're even blaming that on global warming. So I just don't know. And uh, I know there are scientists that mean well that are trying to do well, but sometimes I, I really uh, think that they are in it more for the money or for uh, something else when they come out with some of their ideas. But I will tell you this. Uh, I do believe God's got it under control, and, and it's God's plan, whatever it may be. But uh, also there's some um, I've heard mention about uh, global cooling, that we are going through a mini ice age or a, a cooling time. Uh, I, I just, uh, right now, I haven't uh, been able to get my mind around that either. I actually believe we go through normal cycles, if I believed anything uh, because of that, of uh, when you take a tree and you cut the tree down and you look at the rings of a tree can tell you a lot about the climate. And if you happen to ever cut wood and cut an, an older tree down, uh, say there's a lot of these trees that have been cut down for wood are very, very old trees. And um, you can tell by the rings, the wider rings, skinnier rings, uh, all uh, scars and things in the rings. Uh, there, in a guy, there's people that study that that know it a whole lot better than I do. But the fact is that we've had some really cold winters and we've had some warm ones. So let's go back to a little bit. And I know most of you that are watching can do this and would probably agree with me. But we have been much milder, warmer in the winter months than what we were, say, 30 and 40 years ago. And um, so the best history that I have is what I have lived in my little lifespan. And when I was growing up, this very same area right here, I grew up in, and we had much colder winters. It would not be unusual throughout the wintertime to miss here at least a couple of weeks of school. Now they allow in a few days and they have their spring break. 
and should they end up would have a bad winter, the school would use the spring break days for that. Oftentimes, we would use our two weeks up, plus we would end up not having much of any of a spring break in the spring, which back used to, I didn't really care about that. I was just like, let us out of school a week earlier. But anyway, uh, you know, if we had spring break coming, just let us out of school a little bit earlier, I was ready for summer vacation. But they had stuff built in to accommodate the cold weather. Nowadays, it's very, very rare that they need to use one of their built-in days uh, for uh, bad weather. Uh, it'll be, uh, sometimes they use them for something else, but my, uh, uh, I remember it getting cold enough when I was a boy uh, where, um, you, like for instance, one time me and a neighbor man that lived up the road here, he uh, called because we were out of school and he I had some beagles and he had a beagle hound and he said would you like to go rabbit hunting and I said well yes I ain't, don't have anything else to do today I'll well, we'll go rabbit hunting so we went but it was five degrees above zero and uh, it gotten so cold and it stayed around that temperature for several days it would get down below zero at night it was uh, you know might warm up to five degrees 10 degrees during the day and go back and it stayed that way for several days the rabbits went in their holes so they had they get holes they bury up in the ground and there was no rabbits out we we didn't do any good in places that there normally you would go and there'd be uh, a whole bunch of rabbits there wasn't because it was so cold in fact we about froze to death ourselves we didn't stay out too long but the rabbits had more sense than we did they they didn't participate but nonetheless, uh, it would get very cold. My grandfather used to tell me that the river over here, we live on the Arkansas River, and uh, he used to farm up and down the river and stuff. And down here at our local town, there is a place called Summer's Ferry. And what they would do is they had an old-timey ferry that was on a cable, and you would load your horses, whatever you had, equipment, onto a uh, um a barge and they would pull you across to the other side well when it would get really really cold in the uh, winter time it would freeze over and the barge couldn't cross the river and my grandpa said that he had taken horses and uh, looks like a mosquito or a fly bugging me there my grandpa said they would take buggies and go across the ice uh, or horses and wagons you know not buggies I suppose but uh, big covered wagons and they would drive them across that ice because the they couldn't move the barges and it was solid enough that it would hold a team of horses and a covered wagon up on the ice now in my lifetime i have seen it froze over but i've never seen it that severe and what concerns me right now is we have our attention focused on so many other things uh food shortages uh, a big concern this winter that there could be a severe food shortage we have our minds on uh, just normal day-to-day -day preparations the kung flu is a concern we're also in an election year here in the united states i realize that uh, i don't know around the world some of you that talk from uh, that comment from other country countries like australia and the uk and stuff i'm not sure if you um uh, have any elections this year, anything like that going on. But here in the United States, we have our elections going on. So that is a concern also. And things are kind of heated this year. So, you know, some, but we've had so many things this year. 2020 has been like a roller coaster that uh, it makes you wonder what's next. And my concern is that we would have a much colder than normal than what we've been get, getting used to and uh, maybe going back the other way with our temperatures and uh, already this year out in Colorado we have friends that go there around the first of September and they bow and arrow hunt for deer and elk and stuff like that and they got out this year there this year and they weren't prepared for the snow and what all uh, happened they had an early snow and they were, it was colder than normal and uh, kind of caught them off guard so uh, it for sure on that aspect it was a little early I seen where Michigan is already getting snows and they say it's early snow 
Uh, they were even mentioning up in New York to get prepared. They could have an early snow. Wisconsin, uh, other states that are having an early uh, snowfall, which to me uh, means that we're going to have an early winter. And I just got a feeling we're going to have a colder than normal winter. So it's time to get prepared for it. Uh, one thing that's made me think we may have a colder than normal winter is the squirrels have went crazy this year on the pecans uh, and the nuts uh, more than normal. Uh, over here where I feed my chickens, the ground is just covered with uh, pecan holes and the squirrels every morning. And anytime I go out there, I scare off several uh, squirrels that run off. I don't mean to scare them off. They just take off and you can see them heading towards the woods. And they have really went to town on the uh, pecans right now and uh, it, it to me they're fattening up for a reason I think nature knows God's instilled in nature I also have noticed that here that the deer the wild deer uh, are eating more and we have uh, some feed the places put out up here for the deer and my son uh, uh, has cameras set up and we have seen a bunch of deer already early usually it's later on when it gets a little colder before we see the deer as an abundant as many as coming out so i'm just really going more off of what i feel like i feel like we're due a colder than normal winter uh, we haven't had much uh, snow or ice the past several years so if we we could very well come into a colder, a more icy, more snowy winter, and being prepared for that would be uh, very, very wise. Um, when I was a young man, and uh, part of it, I think, was just the old house we lived in, but it got cold, and uh, I don't like the cold now, but I was thinking about if it got as cold as it used to get, you know, uh, right now the wind's really blowing and today I'd look out and see the trees moving and stuff and it makes me think that it's a lot colder than it is. It's cold enough for a jacket today, but it looked like a lot colder than what you would think it is just by seeing the trees blowing and I've seen a lot of leaves blowing off the trees. But I remember as a boy sitting in the house, it'd be windy like this, and you could hear it whipping through the windows, and uh, you could hear that whistling sound that the wind makes, and uh, oh, it'd make it sound cold. Sometimes I might watch a, a western like Gunsmoke, and you'll hear them, uh, they'll make that noise on purpose, <laughs> the wind whipping through, and mom would make us kids... When it got real cold, she'd make us go in and sleep in the living room. That's where the wood stove was. And she would hang a curtain or a blanket, an old quilt, down where the hall went down, shut all of our bedroom doors and put a quilt there to help block in the heat to try to keep the house warm. And we would sleep in the living room. Uh, us boys, we had two divans, and me and my brother would sleep on the divans, and our sisters, the three of them, would sleep on the floor. Now, I loved that back then. I thought that was really a neat uh, thing to get to sleep on the divan was a treat. And I remember watching a uh, Andy Griffith show where Opie was going to have to sleep on an ironing board. And they put it between two pieces of furniture and slept on that. And the visitor was like, oh, no, I don't want him to have to do that. And Opie said, oh, I love it. I love it. Well, back then, I loved that kind of stuff. But I would not ha want to have to sleep in the living room now. Also, you know, your beds, when you'd go stay at anyone's house, especially Granny's house, uh, one of my grandma's, uh, well, a couple of them I can remember going and staying, and the beds, it was like you were climbing a mountain just to get up on the bed, and they would have so many blankets on the bed that you couldn't hardly turn over or move because of all the weight from the quilts and blankets, and uh, they really, uh, well, it's because it got cold, and you needed the... Uh, extra warmth and uh but it you know a lot of times you'd go to bed and it would seem so cold when you would go to bed but after you were under all them blankets for a while it gets warm if you've ever camped out overnight at uh, winter time camping uh it's that way when you first go to bed you're like boy it is so cold and uh you know and stuff but you get in your sleeping bag and get whatever blankets you got however you uh 
camp, it ain't long till you start getting warmed up. In fact, I've got in my sleeping bag and zipped up before camping out in the wintertime and it wasn't long, I was unzipping it wanting some cool air to start coming in to help uh, cool the uh, sleeping bag off. But you get warmed up, but people knew what to do back in the old days. And uh, if we lost electric, we had wood heat. So there was no problem with heat. And uh, we, uh, we could cut, if we ran out of wood, we, uh, we had chainsaws and equipment. We could just go right over and cut some wood uh, with no trouble at all. There was always plenty of trees, still plenty of trees to cut for wood. And, uh, you know, nowadays a lot of folks don't burn wood. We don't burn wood. One reason people don't is the, if you have insurance on your home, oftentimes they'll drop you or skyrocket your uh, insurance because of wood heat and around here every year there's a home or two or three that burn because of the wood heat something goes wrong or it's blamed on the wood heat oftentimes starts in the chimney so if you do those kind of things a lot of people here have wood as a backup if it gets super cold well having your chimney clean and having things ready having some dried out wood seems to be that the the seasoned wood does better as far as not putting so much creosote in your uh, chimney that could catch on fire but having some pre-seasoned wood and having things ready uh, just in case you need the heat and making sure everything's ready to go in case you lost electricity and you had to burn wood if, if you burn wood or having some type of a gas backup uh, uh, one uh, thing we do here we have a little infrared um, I call them infrared they got little bricks in them they don't require any electricity and it's um, if we lose electric we have propane and that's another th key thing if you're going to burn propane or some type of gas like that uh, make sure you have plenty of it and uh, one thing we do is uh, we have an extra tank. I call it the, our strategic reserve. You know, the federal government has a strategic reserve of uh, oil. So we have our strategic reserve put back as well, just in case. I never need that second tank. But the first year we lived here, we had uh, moved back here and started living back here 12 years ago. And we had a really bad ice storm. Uh, we moved here like in October. And in January or February, along in there, we had a really bad ice storm, and we lost electricity. And uh, they, uh, uh, we were out for an entire week without electric. And so um, we, I had bought a generator that year. I had thought about that. Well, they had one on sale down at our local hardware store. Um, it sat there from August clear up till whenever, November, December. And I was in there one day and I said, how much uh, are y'all asking for that generator? And he said, well, last year we had a severe ice storm and we had lost electricity for over 30 days. I remember my parents um, going from home and staying up at one of my uncles who uh, still had electricity because they had lost electric and it was around 30 days a whole month without electricity it was such a severe ice storm and knocked out the power everywhere and it took that long to restore the electric so my folks uh, uh, just went and stayed my uncle he had electric in his home and so they just went and stayed there but anyway he said we had sold this generator during that time and the guy brought it back claimed that it wouldn't work after the ice storm was over everything cleared up he brought the generator back and so he said it's still got a warranty we're selling it just like brand new have a year warranty all that stuff so now i've had that for approximately 12 years and it still runs does well but i was thankful i'd bought it and they made me a really good deal good price on it he said, we'd like to get it out of here. So uh, <laughs> that winter, sure enough, in about two or three months, why uh, we lost electric. And after a few hours, we didn't know how long it was going to be. Everything was icy. You could hear limbs falling out of the trees and stuff. You'd think about that just having an ice storm the year before, a severe one, that you wouldn't have had another one. But we did. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> What we'd do is we'd run our generator during the daytime and it would run about five gallons worth of gas and gas was high that year. And uh, so it really cost me to burn that for electricity. But what we would do is plug in our freezers 
everything, we would get everything froze good. And at night when we went to bed, I would turn the generator off. The next morning I would refuel it. We'd run it again and keep everything going. And we, we had borrowed a heater that uh, one of these old timey gas heaters, I call them old timeys. You re may remember, they used to, you just turn the gas on and stick a match in there and it would light, didn't have a pilot or anything. Well, we had borrowed one of those and it hooked in for heat and we were able to make it. But that burnt a lot of our propane. And that spring, uh, about March, um, a month or two later, we actually ran out of, or thought we were gonna run out of propane. So I called the gas company and I said, would y'all bring us uh, some propane? And they said, yes, we sure will. Uh, says, uh, uh, it's $4, roughly $4 a gallon. And I was like, boy, I was like, that's high. You know, it seemed like I had paid around a dollar um, back in the early fall, August, September for it. So I said, well, uh, come on and bring it. They said, well, you have to buy at least 100 gallons. And I said, well, 100 gallons is all I can afford. <laughs> bring it out here and put 100 gallons in. So they did. And we got the, the 100 gallons. And that held us over until uh, the next... Um, August that through the summer and stuff and then we filled up again But I decided to buy an extra tank and put it there just in case something went wrong We would have it another thing we used to have me and Josie that we heated with was we had a round kerosene heater and uh, You uh, it out. <clears throat> I forget exactly how it lit but when we lived in Arkansas we lived in a pretty rural area and had lost electricity from time to time. And I had bought one of these little heaters and we had a, a store, a gas station that you could buy a kerosene from that it just like a regular pump, like a gas pump. And you bring your five gallon jugs, whatever you had, and you just fill up. And it was kind of pricey uh, back then. And I've noticed now kerosene is very high in the uh, stores like Atwoods and places you can buy it in five gallon uh, containers, but uh, I, uh, to me it seems very pricey. But in the event of an emergency, uh, you could have backup heat, and we did that with this little kerosene heater. Now it put off some fumes. You know, you smell that kerosene burning. It didn't bother me. Kind of reminded me of the old times when we were kids, when you'd lose electric and they'd get the old lanterns out uh, and light them up. You know, and you'd kind of smell that kerosene uh, burning. Uh, they didn't use lamp oil back then. They would use uh, kerosene. So uh, I didn't mind that smell, but we, uh, but we were we, up there in Arkansas. We lost electric uh, several different times and was out for a day or two. And uh, we, we needed some heat, so we would light up that thing and it put it in the living room there, and it would heat pretty good. It didn't heat as good as our regular heat did, but it got us by. But having something to back up on and and be prepared. One thing that I want to say, just as a safety note, you can buy uh, little heaters that will go in your tank, like uh, little tanks like you would use at your barbecue grill, the little white ones. I think they call them 30 gallon tanks, whatever. You can take them here and you go downtown and they have a, a cabinet thing at the store and they'll come out and switch with you and they'll trade you containers and, and stuff like that. Well, um, there was a guy across the river here, just to give you a little note of safety, that he said for some reason, um, he, his heat had quit and he was using uh, one of them that you screw the heater, it's kind of infrared heater, into that tank and you light it and use it. Something went wrong. He uh, Evidently, it had leaked the gas out. He didn't get that tight. I, 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 they never did know for sure. But he would come home from work and went to light his heater. And propane is heavier than air. It will drop to the floor. So if you're standing up here, you may not smell it real strong. You'll pro you probably would smell it, but not real strong. But the guy went to light that heater. And when he did, uh, his it blew up. And he uh, went and uh, was able to walk to a neighbor's house. Uh, his clothes burn off and everything in very bad shape. And the neighbor was able to uh, get him medical assistance, but he died. They took him to the hospital and he passed away from his uh, injuries that he sustained there 
in that fire. So I just want to tell you, if you're going to do something like that, be very safe. If you're going to put your own heater in, make sure you check for gas leaks. I'm, this may be a no-brainer to people, but every year I was on the fire department here, the volunteer uh, Sequoia County Rural Fire District here, and we you'd see stuff every year that was human error and if you'll if you'll be safe with propane or natural gas or wood heat if you're safe with any of those areas and do all you can you're normally okay but being safe and checking and rechecking and you could take soap um, like take a Dawn dish soap and put it in a little container and get you a little brush and brush around all the fittings and stuff and look for, you know, there's a difference in just soapy bubbles, but uh, if there's an air leak, it will bubble up. And sometime I'll try to show on a video in case you've never done that. Most people probably have and it's like a no brainer to you, but it will pop up a bubble. It'll blow a, a little bubbles up if it's leaking and make sure you uh, don't have any gas leaks. Just be safe with any kind of backup. And if you don't know what you're doing, uh, leave it alone and call someone who does. And, you know, you might say, well, I don't want to call a person that does it for a living because it's going to cost me a whole lot of money. But sometimes you'd be better off to do that and may save you your life or the life of your family in the long run. One more safety note I want to throw out. With being a colder than normal winter, and maybe having to use generators, maybe having to use backup sources or heat. And even if it's just a normal winter, make sure you have, you check the batteries in your smoke detectors. And there are people, I mentioned this last year, and I had some comment uh, rudely that they weren't going to do smoke detectors, that that's just government baloney and stuff like that I, you know if you don't want a smoke detector that's your business if you die because you uh, your house caught on fire and burnt you alive that is your deal but if you got children and you got others in your home for safety make sure you have a smoke detector and check the batteries right now or push the little button make sure it works right now in the fall and spring when the time changes when they recommend when it change time in the fall when you change it in the spring uh, but have your routine that you go ahead and just change the batteries in your smoke detectors push the little test button make sure it works if you have wood heat and we did growing up and our heater would smoke the house up sometimes when mom was trying to get it lit or my mom controlled the heat for some reason she did it but dad cut the wood he, he didn't mind to put wood on stove in the heater. He didn't bought, bought mind uh, helping with all of it. My job was every evening to carry in wood to make sure there's plenty of wood on the front porch that would stay dry, you know, if we had rains or whatever. Also to make sure there's plenty of wood split and ready and ricked up out, on out for, and then to bring in wood. And we had a little wood box area that you stored wood in near to the wood stove and mom would take and put the, she would get up early like oh five o'clock four or five o'clock in the morning and get the heater stoked up if you sleep in the living room you usually got woke up because she was opening this door and she's putting it in there but it would feel so good when you got up that good warm heat but being safe and sometimes if the fire had died down or something went wrong and mom was trying to get it started, we would get um, uh, smoke in the house and it would set the smoke detectors off. So that was aggravating. And so, uh, you know, maybe somebody would go and take the smoke detector down or take the batteries off. But my folks were always careful to make sure those was put back in before we went to bed. So at the slightest hint of smoke, we would have been warned of a fire and homes can go so quickly and every year somewhere around this part of the country there is some people get killed in a house fire and it's usually because they did not have any kind of smoke detector fire detector uh, to go off another thing is carbon monoxide detectors and this may be preaching to the choir and you may say well i'm total electric just here while back in these one of these hurricanes that come through you would think well people's total electric why would they need a carbon monoxide detector lo and behold somehow fumes came through from their generator and killed some people if you had a carbon monoxide detector you can buy them that will plug in a receptacle 
in your home. If you lose electric, it has a battery that stays charged and you would be not warned if it goes off. If it goes off even the littlest bit, get somebody to come and check at your home. I've had people go buy them on my recommendation and they went off. And they take them out and thinking something's wrong with them, but they actually went off because they had carbon monoxide. I had a family that a guy that wanted, I'll just tell this quick story about this. He wanted new central heating and air put in his home. That's what we do as a, a little side business, a home business, base business, whatever you want to call it, me and my son. So we go out and I give him an estimate. He wants a new one. And his unit to me was not all that old. He didn't look bad, but he said, we just don't trust it. We never have since we've been here and said, my wife gets sick every winter. And so uh, he said, I think it's to do with that gas heater. So we put him in a new heater. When we go to put the new vent in, the vent was just vented up into the attic area. It didn't go on out the roof. So uh, I, uh, I told him, I said, have you, um, is this all, do you know about this? I said, it don't go, it just vents up in the attic space. You could actually walk up in the attic, but they just used it for storage. And he said, well, I don't know anything really about how you do all that. And I said, well, it needs to vent on out. So we ran the vent on out. But he asked me, he said, would that cause carbon monoxide perhaps to come into the home? And I said, it very well could. And he said, well, we bought a carbon monoxide detector because we didn't trust that heater. And my wife was getting sick with carbon monoxide symptoms. And uh, so he said, we got it. And said so we put it in and said just 10 or 15 minutes, it was going off. And said, we thought there was something wrong with it. So we unplugged it. And uh, he said, my wife would uh, mostly be sick when she's at home, but we could go to town and she'd get feeling better. He went to town every day and he never got sick, but she did. Well, the next year she did fine. And it was because she was getting carbon monoxide poison. It's something that didn't kill him. So I'm just telling you this for, for a reason. Be safe and do what you can to protect you and yours. And, uh, you know, if you have young children and people there, you know, a lot of times youngsters just don't really pay attention at all. You know, as you get older, you worry about everything. And when you're young, you think, well, you're going to live forever. Why worry? But and then not, not to worry or be scared, but to be concerned and to take precautions does make a lot of sense. But anyway, being prepared this winter, a few things to do is your hydrants. Any exposed water lines. Maybe you've not covered up your water lines in years. Perhaps you haven't insulated them. Maybe you used to did, but you don't now because we've had milder winters. We've definitely, here in Oklahoma, we have had the last 20 and 30 years milder winters. And the last 10 years has been extremely mild. Last year, we had a little dusting of snow that lasted for a day and then it was gone. The year before that, I don't think we got any snow. About 10 years ago, or 11 or 12, along in that range, right after we'd moved here a year or so after, and when I told you the first year we had the ice storm, we had a pretty good snow that lasted here three or four days. It just land, you know, it got on the ground, it kept the ground covered, but since then we haven't had, and even the cold weather, we may have a night or two that it gets down in the teens, but very few nights that get below freezing. This summer, we did not have, and people here will gripe and say that they did, that we had an extremely hot summer. But folks, we really did not have that extremely hot. We had some high humidity, but I don't know here at our homestead, um, I have a little box that keeps track of the weather. And I'm not sure that we ever exceeded in real temperature that we ever exceeded 100 degrees. We got up like 99, stuff like that. Now, the heat index, we did get up 106, 100, 810 in the heat index. So, you know, that's where they take your combination of humidity and real temperature. But as far as the real heat, but we had the no summer before the temperatures was not as hot as we had. Now, we had a summer a few years back. Uh, we actually had two or three summers, but one summer that it got so hot that we hit 100 
for a record amount of days, real temperature here. And we'd get up 104, 105, 106, real temperature, not considering the uh, heat index when you add in the humidity, it really got hot here, which was ab abnormally hot. I really believe we go through a natural cycle. We have, it takes years we go up and years we go back down. Uh, I will throw in this with global warming. To, if it's took all these years of dumping Freon, dumping coal gases, all this stuff to destroy the environment, if that is the case, and that's what's caused us to go into a period of warming, it appears right now we're going into a period of cooling. Uh, I'm not calling it anything special other than we're going back through a period of cooling. But if it is, folks, it will take years for the planet to heal if it was man-made problems. And so this would be just a temporary cooling. It's not solving it. What I'm trying to say is we haven't gone through enough measures to cause the earth to start cooling, I don't believe. It would take years and years for it to heal. But this cooling, I believe, is a natural phenomenon. And uh, I, I do believe that we are warming. When I say that, people think I'm into this global warming thing that a lot of people call a hoax. And I'm not even here to argue that stuff, but I'm just saying that I believe we go through natural cycles and I believe that we're going through a natural cooling down. Do you remember back when you were a kid, what you learned in school? You didn't learn about global warming. Now they teach global warming in schools. They did not teach that. I remember our son coming home and he was having a test on climate change and global warming and all this different stuff. And they teach it, you know, like a religion almost. But when I was a kid, they believed we were headed back to an ice age. And, uh, you know, it was getting cold, uh, temperatures, it was, it was rough times. And, uh, uh, but around here, most people burnt wood. There was very little gas heat. And uh, they were telling us in school, they were taught about going, that one day we would go through another ice age. And now, <laughs> you know, it was going through another warming. I really don't think man knows, but I know God knows all about it. But getting ourselves prepared, if you got hydrants outside, um, that aren't uh, protected. If you got hoses hooked up, maybe you need to consider this year unhooking those hoses. Maybe folks a little further south uh, of us uh, may take a little more precautions than what you normally do. If you've been around a while and lived in this part of the country, uh, you know, was living here 50 years ago or more, then you know uh, how it used to could be. And maybe getting prepared for that just in case, rechecking your water lines. A lot of folks used to have heaters on exposed water lines. Maybe you need to make sure those heaters are still working or replace those heaters. But get yourself in a position. If we lost electricity because of an ice storm, um, if we, it seems like now we didn't have a lot of ice storms growing up. We would just have snowstorms, and uh, kind of like a blue northern would blow in. The wind would blow so hard, and the wind would get to blowing and the weight of the snow and stuff would break the power lines down. The past some years now, it seems like we're more prone to get a severe ice storm, which will weight the power lines down. It may melt off the next day, but you're without power for several days. But what if you lost power and your only source of heat was central heating and air? You don't have a generator. You have no backup source to heat. And what are you going to do? Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, you were tough enough that you could just turn your cook stove on and survive. Uh, being in the heating and air business, that's something that surprises me is people that will lose their heat. And, uh, you know, cold weather, they have no backup whatsoever. Oftentimes, uh, maybe their heat's just broke down their central heat, but you got to order a control board or something weird that has quit and we don't have. And right now, some parts are hard to get because of the Kung flu virus. So you say, well, uh, what are we going to do? How are you going to get your part? Well, take a few days. Well, they don't have any backup at all. And sometimes people will go buy electric heaters and plug them in. Well, that makes your electric bill skyrocket. But not only that, Every winter, we'll have a house or two around here that will burn down because of electric space heaters. They'll have those heaters on, stuff gets too close to them, and they burn up. So getting prepared and having something that would be safe and um, good for you and your family ahead of time, just in case. You know, in the summertime here, we do more air conditioning repair than we do anything. 
and people will act like they're going to die if they don't have air conditioning. And I will tell you, you'll come a lot more to surviving the warm weather because you can always go outside and sit under a tree. But to me, it's a lot harder to survive in cold weather. Also having a little food and water. We keep talking about having food and water prepared back, but what if it got bad? There's a lot of people around here that go to the grocery store nearly every day. Um, some of our family don't hardly keep any food at all and oftentimes will stop by the store to pick up what they're gonna prepare for supper. What if the roads got so bad? What if we got a severe snowstorm, severe icing, whatever? What if the stores locked, lost electricity? Nowadays, your grocery stores can't operate. The old grocery stores, when I was growing up, we had one here called Hayes's grocery store and uh, they would look at each item and they would just uh, hit buttons and put the price in and the old machine would just put you out a, a manual deal and well, my mom would just charge the groceries so they would just write each item down you know 49 cents or whatever and most items were less than a dollar anyway and they would just make up a list have you sign it and you pay for it later but they would still operate without having electricity and they didn't have barcoding, all the modern things today. Now your, gro your grocery store could not operate without electricity. Now some stores have backup generators and things. Sometimes they only have the backup just for the refrigeration systems and not for <clears throat> the lighting and the electronics. So they have to shut down if they lose electricity. So what if things happen in your neighborhood? Maybe you couldn't even get to town because there was such a snowstorm. The first year when me and Stacy got married... They're also Stacy and Josie, that's my wife, same name, same person. I call her Josie usually, but I slipped there and mentioned her real name. No, that's no problem though. Uh, but 27 years ago, we'd gotten married in October. In February or March, the following year, the we had a, a severe snowstorm, an un, unexpected snowstorm. And thank the Lord, we rented a little house from a lady, and it had wood heat. We had not used the wood heat. We had only used the central heat. We didn't have a generator, nothing like that. It was on well water. So without electricity, we didn't have any water. Without electric, we had no heat, except for it had an old wood fireplace. And thankfully, I had gotten wood and ricked up because I thought it would be fun to have a fire. The, the lady that we rented from had moved to Michigan. She's originally from a Michigan and she had moved back to her place a home and we and she knew us and she had offered to rent us her, her home when we got married. So uh, I actually moved in it a little while, a month or two ahead of time, but I'd gotten some wood prepared. She had left some wood there too. And uh, she had told me, you know, if you lost electric, you would want the wood heat. Well, thank the Lord, I had prepared and I had wood. To, and we, we couldn't go anywhere. It got so bad, we were stuck there for several days. I couldn't go to work. Uh, my wife couldn't go to work. We were just uh, stranded. But uh, we had a gas cook stove that didn't require electric. So we were able to cook and we were able to uh, run the fireplace there. And uh, actually, I'll just tell you, for newlyweds, it was kind of fun. It was a good time in our life. It was old-timey-like. Back in those days, we were both raised in the country and uh, pretty uh, simple, humble beginnings. So we were kind of used to it, and we uh, was like, we can't go nowhere. In fact, the, the snow plows come through, the road graders and stuff, and they pushed the snow up so high in our driveway you couldn't have got out if you wanted to and uh, so uh, we didn't want to because there people we had talked to our phone still worked so we would call people and it's like well it's still awful bad out and my work was shut down and her work was shut down so we we were home for a few days but we survived because we were prepared so I just want to tell you today be prepared and always being prepared knowing who supplies our blessings I come from above and when we've done all we can, all, when the Bible says, having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And that's the word of God. And when we have, we know what God's word says. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's there. Sometimes we can do all we know to do and we still forget to prepare for something. God understands and he knows. And folks, I appreciate you watching today. I hope you... Uh, 
will take heed to what I'm trying to tell you today. And uh, I hope we don't have a bad winter. I would, like I said earlier, I'm kind of liking this global warming, <laughs> whatever they call it. I've liked the warmer weather. It's so much easier on me feeding my uh, cows in the wintertime, doing the chores when it's warmer. But I think we're due a bad winter and being prepared. If it don't get bad, it hasn't hurt me. It ain't going to cost me nothing really i'm prepared anyway i have that peace of mind and if i happen to forget about something i know the good lord if i'll do the, my part the lord will do the rest and we sure appreciate you watching today may god richly bless you and we'll see you next time tuesday nights at seven o'clock for another episode of porch talk and we're gone <laughs>